Okay, brethren, it's a brave new world we're living in, that is for sure. And all the more reason to continue what we were talking about some weeks ago on titled Using God's Spirit. We went through part one. I want to pick up on part two today. Using God's Spirit was the title of part one, so we'll stick with that as part two in this uh, continuing uh, narration of what we had started some weeks ago. If you recall, just a short thumbnail sketch and review, we opened up the discussion over in Acts 2 and used basically the words of uh, many of the people uh, that uh, mentioned after Peter's first sermon, what shall we do, and Peter's answer in directing them as to what they should do. And we took from that point of the sermon and began to expand and what you could say explore just how to go about doing these things and why it was so important uh, to receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. To remind many of us on what Peter told those individuals who were pricked in their heart after hearing Peter's first sermon we read here in verse 38 of chapter 2 in the book of Acts, Peter said unto them, this was the answer, after they said, well, what shall we do? After they were compelled to ask Peter that from hearing what he had mentioned to them through verses about 14 or so, uh, through verses 37 of Acts 2, Peter responds in verse 38 and states this, and then Peter said unto them, that is the audience, repent, change your ways, repent, Get baptized, be baptized, every one of you, in the name, specifically in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness, for the erasing of, for the elimination of, for the covering of sin. That was what Peter's recommendation was for them. Why? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Very important item, a very important element uh, that plays into this whole uh, scheme of salvation that is so important for you and I in recognizing the need for having this supernatural power. Now, in John chapter 14, we went over there after defining a bit of what sin was and so on and talked about the discussion that ensued around the dinner table that night during the Last Supper. And in regards to chapter 14, as we began to uh, explore some of that, and again, this is just a little bit of review here, Jesus was mentioning about how he was going away to prepare a place. We talked about how he would be preparing through guiding your own lives, through his will now being essentially part of your lifestyle because you're allowing God's will now to supersede your own will so that your will is not enforced over God's will. You're more receptive to doing what God expects of you than what you want to do. And so you concede and you surrender this will and your lifestyle now is devoted in knowing how to do that so that Christ can be manifested more clearly, more dominantly, uh, more predominantly in, in all the things that you think, say, and do. And we went through this in chapter 14 and brought our attention to the fact of how it was so important that Jesus would now introduce in these last hours before he was betrayed and arrested, taken before the kangaroo court, convicted, beat, and then crucified mercilessly, and then killed and then buried in a tomb or entombed, I guess you could say, in a tomb. He really wasn't buried, technically speaking, for three days and three nights, only to resurrect, validating, confirming that he was indeed who he said he was, and of which Peter's sermon was all about that in Acts 2. That's what Peter was talking about, because Peter was validating the eyewitness experience he had when seeing Christ alive after he, Peter, knew he was dead. He saw him beaten. He saw him hanging on the stake. He saw him breathe his last breath. They were there. They watched it. Uh, Nicodemus, 
uh, was there even. Uh, the guy that came snuck by night, remember in John chapter 3? He was there along with uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who is most likely, as, as uh, many commentators will tell you, used his family tomb to put Christ's body in. And it was those two guys that took his body into the tomb and laid it there. And I'm sure Nicodemus, as I've often said, because he knew what Jesus was telling him in John 3. And he knew being a teacher of teachers. He was a Jewish Pharisee by trade. He knew what Jesus meant when he said, you must be born again, Nicodemus. So he was having, he's had a box seat that day when Jesus was dead. And I'm sure, as I've often said, he was probably poking the body and making sure this guy was indeed dead. But three days and three nights, as Peter said, we saw him. We talked with him again for 40 more days after he died, or after he was killed, I should say. He walked the earth as a spirit being, appearing and reappearing in rooms with closed doors, cooking and eating on the shore. I mean, all kinds of things the Bible says John wrote there in the latter chapters of the Gospel of John, that if all the things were written, the books couldn't contain what those guys saw. And I've often said it's not so much of the volume of pages that could have been written, it's what they saw and experienced that couldn't be contained because it would sound like science fiction. A spirit being walking among human mortals, showing them what they could do once they acquired this kind of spirit body. It's an amazing story, brethren. And it's a vision. It's a vision that Jesus wanted so badly to get into the minds of his, his buddies this night around the table with few hours left so much to talk about and so little time so little time to say it but he proceeds and he mentions in this case as we pointed out in chapter 14 i'm not going to read a lot there other than to reference four, verses 14 uh, through about 21 regarding the fact that he introduces to them this parakletos, parakletos, however you want to say the Greek. There's a couple of ways you can pronounce it, but the fact of it is this comforter, this supernatural power that resides in you upon repentance and baptism and of which does indeed empower you, guides you, leads you, and it gives you insight to understand the truths of what your Bible really has to say not just tradition, not, not, not the civil confusion that has emerged over the many eons of, of decades and time and millennia that has confused this message, but the Holy Spirit, brethren, guides you into all truth. That's what we're told. If, if we as human beings put our will to the side and allow God's will to truly lead us, to truly lead us, Jesus talks about it there in chapter 14. He digresses in chapter 15, goes on to some other uh, subjects with regards to establishing his friendship with his disciples, assuring them that uh, they are part and parcel to basically uh, a family in, in essence. And he comes down through, uh, finally, as mentioned uh, uh, some weeks ago, to uh, chapter 16 where we had cut off the um, uh, presentation at that time illustrating the fact that this spirit actually does indeed come from the Father through Christ to you. It is God the Father's, lack of a better term, DNA that is in you via this spiritual ingredient called the parakletos, the Holy Spirit and it resides in you. It is something. I, I hesitate to attempt to try to associate it with something physical, but it is something. And God knows you have it when you get it. And the way you get it is through repentance and baptism and public admission of accepting Jesus the Christ as your personal savior and commit to the fact of allowing him to be your model for your lifestyle, to be your model for the way you think, to be your model for the way you perceive right and wrong. What I read to you here, brethren, before I got up here to give the presentation, 
Do you know that there are people that applaud this stuff? That's how far many human, and I say many, and I'm not apologizing for it, many human minds have been distorted, distracted, perverted to think that that is okay, to think that that's right, that it's something to applaud, that it's something to progressively get behind support and back and continue to thrust forward for additional approval and expansion of embracement and acceptance. But God be praised, the Holy Spirit in you will afford you the stability under the pressures of the civil environment you live in that will hold you solid and anchor you in the truth because the Holy Spirit, according to the words of Jesus Christ, is capable of guiding you into all truth. However, I emphasize, you must take the time. You gotta download information. If you don't read this stuff, if you don't study it, if you don't digest it, remember the four things that I went through some months ago? Bible study, prayer, fasting, meditation. Those four wheels allow you to afford the resonation in you that waters and feeds and fertilizes the Holy Spirit in you so that when the times do come and you're confronted with issues and circumstances, and you will be, brethren, I, I can't emphasize enough. It makes my heart ache to even sometimes talk about these things because it is now beginning to happen. It is now begin it's in our face. Things are changing, and we are on the slippery slope. And the only way that you are going to be able to guard your children, to protect your young adults, to keep them informed, is to take time to ensure and to help better ensure through, through exposing them to the proper understanding of what really is right and wrong. I said before that there's all kinds of things that people think are now acceptable, right, and okay to do from even lying. People, there's people that think lying's okay. You can lie. You can be a liar. There's nothing wrong, especially white lies. Everybody does white lies, right? No. White lies, no lies, uh, uh, wrong lies, black lies, purple lies are lies. Lies are lies, you know. You don't steal. Well, because he's got enough, he can afford to give to me. No, that, that's, that's not right. And yet there are people who are intent on taking from those who have to give and force. And there's nothing wrong with giving to those who have not. And I'm not against those who have to be able to give to those who have not. Don't get me wrong in that. But to force individuals to give in areas that perhaps they're not wanting to give because they have their own choices or should have their own freedom of choice is really the right thing. But there are people that don't think that that's right anymore, that they should be forced. And as I've often said on the morality side and the sexual side of things, uh, I could, you, you, you know, all of us could talk for hours on that, on how so much has now been watered down that really, I mean, even shacking up with a, with a guy and a girl or two guys and two girls uh, is okay. I mean, that's just part of society. Why, what's so wrong with that? Let's wink at it, you know. I should be able to get baptized, so I'm living with a woman. Let me get baptized. I'm living with her, so what? Everybody lives with, with a woman. Everybody's shacking up. You know, I should still be able to get baptized. And you get into those things. You get into these things because people today have become, in some respects, compromised. And this is what I'm saying, and this is what I'm talking to. Here's the point I'm talking to. If we're not careful, we too can be comprom compromised. Lot was compromised living in Sodom and Gomorrah. He was compromised because he was surrounded by what was legitimized and every day, day in and day out, viewed as being acceptable and right. And eventually, over being hammered with this on and on and on and on, if you are not 
watering and fertilizing yourself with God's knowledge, information, so that that Holy Spirit is vibrant and healthy, you too run the risk. The vulnerability is there, brethren, for all of us to compromise and fall off the saddle, as they say. So Jesus now comes down to chapter 16 in this night in which he was betrayed, still talking around the dinner table. And we pick up the story and the discussion here uh, with him continuing his dialogue with his buddies that night, just hours before he was hauled off and incarcerated by those Roman soldiers that evening. He continues on where we left off, chapter 16. These things, verse 1, I've spoken unto you, that you should not be offended, talking about the things prior to. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming when people will kill you and think they're doing God a service. Now, this is both long-term, this is a prophetic statement, brethren, because it was true in the short term because every one of those guys around the table, except for one, Judas, who killed himself, all were killed, all were martyred. They were all that short period of time within the next 30 years or so were indeed martyred and killed. And so Jesus was right on the short term and I would hope many of you are beginning to see that corners are being turned to where this kind of scenario can very well play out again in the long term. Because as we go down further into this immoral decline, into this cesspool of immorality, those who stand in the gap, those who stand for right, Girls who say, no, I'm not married. Guys who say, no, I'm not married. I'm not going to do that. No, I've had enough. I'm only having one beer. No, I don't smoke dope. No, I don't take quaaludes. No, I don't take LSD. People who do that and stand in the gap and don't get piercings, don't get tattoos, boys have short hair, not long hair, all of these things, you are going to begin to stand out. Especially when you open your mouth and you explain why. Because the time will come, God will want you to declare. You can count on it, wouldn't you? If you were God, wanting to be sure with what God is offering us in terms of eternal life, spirit life, immortality, it's a no-brainer, brethren. God wants us to declare. Therefore, it's important we understand what to declare. It takes study. It takes courage. It takes stamina. It takes resolve. It takes character. It takes a lot of things that we all need to start beginning to think about because the spirit, the persona that you represent is going to become farther and fewer in between. Building the churches of God today in the environment that we're in today is not like it was in the 1960s 1950s, or even for that matter, the 70s and the 80s. It's a far more secular, humanistic, godless world we live in. We even have uh, a declared atheist, a Jewish atheist at that, running for president of the United States, this man named Sanders, an admitted communist, socialist, running for the United States presidency, an atheist, a Jewish atheist at that. We are in some very dynamic times and times that all of us need to be well aware of because Jesus is telling us, get ready, these things will they do unto you, verse 3, because they have not known the Father nor me. They don't know the Father and they don't know me. Oh, they think they know me and some do think they know me. They don't know me. And consequently, they don't know the Father. Verse 4, these things I've told you, that when the time shall come, you remember that I told you of them 
And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you, but now I go my way to him that sent me. I'm going back to the fathers, basically what he's saying in verse 5. And none of you ask me, where do you go? But because I've said these things, sorrows filled your heart. Nevertheless, I'm telling you truth. It is expedient for you I do go, that I go away. For if I go not away, this parakletos, this comforter, will not come to you. And Jesus is intent on making this point. You need it in order to be able to stand in the evil day, as we say in the armor of God when we close out the program. If you think you're going to be able to stand and tiptoe through this whole menagerie of, of force that's coming down on those who are in essence pursuit of a relationship with God, you're, you're mistaken. Even by virtue of what Jesus is saying, he's warning us that night. He was filled with so much that he wanted to tell his buddies. And one of the major things he wanted to tell his buddies is you need the Holy Spirit. You've got to have this parakletos. This is the empowerment that will allow you to be led into truth. It will give you courage. It will give you stamina. It will afford you the kind of faith that will come so that when you say what you've got to say, let the chips fall. Because you know what? We've got to get to this point, brethren. We don't fear death. We don't fear death. Because if that's all you can do to me, hey, have at it, because that's my place of safety as far as I'm concerned. That's my place of safety, because once I'm asleep, because it's really not death, we have to keep that in mind. We have a resurrection still waiting for us, so it's not death. It's just a, it's just a what you could say, yeah, it's, it's an interruption. It's a, a rude interruption between life, between transition. A rude interruption, to be resumed later, like we're doing part two, we're resuming it later. <laughs> we resurrect the subject, and we talk about it again. And that's the, the fact of what the truth of the Bible has that allows us to be encouraged and all the more motivated, I would hope, and compelled to stand strong in these values and these standards. And Jesus is encouraging us. He says, look, I got to go. It's not expedient for you that I... That, uh, that I, it is expedient, that is, it's good for you, it's expedient for you that I do go away, for if I don't, the comforter is not going to come unto you. But if I do depart, I will send him to you. And when he or it is come, it will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. These three items, you could do sermons on each one of them. I won't do that, but I will uh, real quickly here go through these three real fast. Of sin, because they don't believe me of sin. The world's convicted of sin because they do not believe in Jesus Christ. And if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, by extension of that not believing in Jesus Christ, you're not believing in the program of salvation that God the Father affords us as human beings through Jesus Christ. So without believing in Jesus, the world is revealed of sin because we're, de we're, we're, we're the... Um, uh, denouncing. We're denouncing the fact that Christ is the door to eternal life. We're denouncing the whole salvific program of God by denouncing Christ of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. The fact that Christ is alive today, he's at the right hand of the Father, is validation that he is who he said he was and therefore defines the righteousness of God. And if you want to know what that definition is, it's incumbent on all of us to learn it through study. Through study. Because it's all right here. We're going to share some of those scriptures uh, here in a moment. But it's all right here. There's nothing complex about this stuff. You don't even have to be a rocket scientist <laughs> to understand the definitions of what God says are right and what he says are wrong. It's just that you've got to read it, read it for what it says and believe it. And here comes the hard part, exercising the will to do it. That's the hard part. That's the challenge we all have before us as fleshy, carnal human beings who have this variance toward God's law and consequently uh, is truly the, uh, the battle that we're all under. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged, and that's an easy one, because Satan the devil has been judged. He knows his time is short. Jesus has already pre-qualified as his replacement. He is coming back as king of kings and lord of lords, and Satan will be displaced. 
and there will be there will be restitution of all things when Christ comes back and lands on the on uh, Mount of Olives so in verse 12 chapter 16 book of John I pick up I have yet many things to say unto you but you cannot bear them now how be it when it the spirit of truth is come it will guide you here's the assurance now it will guide you into all truth for it shall not speak of itself but whatsoever it shall hear that shall it speak and it will show you the things to come it shall glorify me it shall receive of mine it shall show it unto me anybody that's up here in this lectern or pulpit brethren who's claiming superpowers or wants the attention on themselves put up your antenna turn on the yellow light maybe even an orange light and if he's really over the top maybe you do need to put the red light on any man who is a minister of Jesus Christ who's up here in the lectern teaching you about God should be pointing you not to the organization not to the minister but to Jesus Christ Organizations are good. They have their place. I'm not going to digress into that. I'm not anti-organization. Don't get me wrong. But organizations don't save you. Organizations do not define the church. What defines the church is the impregnation of the Holy Spirit in you. And if you've got it, guess what? You're the church. <laughs> You're the church. You're the ecclesia. You're the called out ones. It's not a corporate name. It's not a computer. It has nothing to do with your status with God. What has everything to do with your status with God is the relationship you have as a result of your study, of your prayer, of your meditation, and of your fastings. And those four efforts, those four segments of where efforts are uh, reposed or put into those areas where you you donate your time and energy to determine your relationship closeness intimacy with your God and consequently the empowerment that comes from the Holy Spirit as a result of you continuing to foster that relationship through those efforts that's so important, so important. And Jesus continues here in verse 14. He shall glorify me, he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. A little while, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me because I go to the Father. Now, some of his disciples among themselves, they said, what? What is this what is this a little while and you shall not see me and again a little while and you shall see me and because I go to the father so they said therefore what what is this that he says a little while we cannot tell what he's saying we don't understand this Jesus he, he recoiled into a prophetic statement there because he knew where he was going and he knew that they were going to learn some things on the other side of his resurrection on the other side of his resurrection that he could not explain until that time came where he could show them because as they say a picture is worth a thousand words and there's only so much you can say until really you got to experience something to really make you understand some things not that always experience is the best teacher but in this context with what Jesus was saying Jesus knew better, so he prophetically stated, look, I'm going, to go a little, I'm going to go away for a little while, but then I'm going to come back. And they got a little confused about that. So they, Jesus asked them, do you inquire among yourselves, verse 19 now, John 16, verse 19, do you inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while and I sh you shall not see me, and again a little while you shall see me? Truly, truly, now when, again, when he says this, verily, verily, he means truly, truly, or he's getting down and he's saying, look, trust me on this he, he he wants he's looking at him right in the eyes and he's saying look trust me on this i want to tell you something really important here this is what he's saying and so he goes on and he says look trust me on this i say unto you that you shall weep and you shall lament the world is going to rejoice you shall be sorrowful but 
Your sorrow is going to be turned into joy. And then he reverts to the woman going through birth and giving uh, birth to a child and how after she goes through her labor and is very painful and hurtful and you know maybe even makes her cry and scream and so forth, after the baby's born, she remembers none of that. She remembers none of that. And he uses this uh, picturesque uh, imagery to illustrate what they are going to experience in his opinion after he goes through this birthing process. And that's what it was. It was a birthing process that he went through. He was born again. Literally, he was born again. He went from mortal to immortal. He went from flesh to spirit. And the process by which that was done was done by the Father who resurrected him from that sleep condition that he was in. And he says here, look, verse 22, you now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man shall take from you. He was speaking directly from the fact that he knew three days and three nights later he was going to be resurrected. He knew, he knew as sure as he was standing there alive talking to them around the dinner table that night that, you know what, guys, you're sad right now, but I guarantee you, you are going to be one happy camper in just a little while. You're going to be like the woman who gives birth to the baby. Yeah, it's painful right now to go through this, and you're going to think, oh, man, where do we miss the boat on this? But you know what? Just be patient because you're going to come out on the other side really much stronger because you aren't going to believe what you're going to see and what I'm going to show you thereafter. And he goes on, and that basically says that. He goes on and he says here, in that day, verse 23, chapter 16, book of John, you shall ask me nothing. Truly I say to you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he'll give you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. These things I've spoken uh, unto you in parables. That's what the word Proverbs means, in parables. But the time's coming. I shall no more speak to you in parables, but I shall show you plainly of the Father at that day. You're going to ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you've loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world. I'm going to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now you speak plainly, you speak no parable. Now we are sure that you know all things and need not that any man should ask you. By this, we believe that you came out from God. I mean, they're agreeing with him. They're, they're saying, Jesus, we believe in what you're saying. We're, we're ex we, we got you 2020. And you would think at this point, Jesus would say, hey, give me a high five, man. I'm glad you got it. But you know what he does? I, this is what I love about our Lord. You've you got to watch this in his personality. He's not a people pleaser. He's not a yes man. He's as real, and he wants reality checks on all of us. And he, he heard all those guys. Oh, yeah, man, we, be we believe you now, Jesus. We, we understand you're from God. You're not talking to us anymore in parables. We get it. We, we see it clearly. Jesus answers them. Verse 31. Do you now believe Behold, the hour is coming, yes, is now come. You're going to be scattered. You're going to run like roaches. You are going to be scared out of your wits. You're running, scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. You're going to desert me. You're going to abandon me. You're going to leave me alone. But I'm not alone. The Father is with me. These things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have trouble. You shall have pressure. This is what the Greek word means. You shall have affliction. You shall have persecution, burdens, trouble. In the flesh you will have these things. But be of good cheer. Be encouraged, in other words. Have boldness, have courage, have courage. I have overcome the world. And so therein lies the answer, the faith in knowing full well that your way of life, your lifestyle, the things that you are allowing your will to sit on the bench and allow God's will to take 
predominance in your life is the assurance that you have that guess what? You can be happy. You can be joyful. You can be assured and insured that you are going to make it into the kingdom of God which is priceless, is priceless when compared to the things that trouble us in this world. That's why Paul said, you know, he reckoned that uh, all things... Uh, there wasn't anything in this world that uh, was worth comparing to uh, the world that would come. So that's why he said keep, keep things in perspective and don't get shook by what this world has uh, effect on us and the things that we experience through it. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, as Paul here talks, he talks about how this Holy Spirit should work. And Jesus talking about the fact of being of good cheer, but nevertheless uh, expecting us now to utilize this spirit in doing the things that are actually articulated in this particular section of chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians and in other areas of the Bible too, but I'm just going to focus on chapter 4 just to at least give you my, the idea here of what I'm talking about. He says here, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. This is a vocation, brethren. You have been called to a lifestyle, to a career, life-changing experience. That's what you've been called to. And it is up to you to maintain that with God's Holy Spirit working in you and staying focused on the things that define the vocation. Verse 2, all lowliness and meekness with long-suffering. That's the attitude. This is the approach. Forbearing one another in love, endeavoring, always pursuing, always aspiring. That's what that means. To keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I can't tell you how often uh, it has been a, d a disappointing experience to, to be even with brethren who cannot seem to get along due to whatever reasons and splits, divisions, arguments, breakups, breaking of fellowship occur. Congregations uh, split and uh, people leave or get disillusioned even over certain conditions and facts uh, that they may see in the church or think they see in the church and consequently leave the faith or leave the fellowship. Maybe they don't leave the faith, and just because they're leaving the fellowship doesn't mean they're leaving the church. I want to make that clear. But it's still sad when people who have known each other for so many years and so on, and many of us in this room have experienced that, uh, because here we sit in a small congregation where some of us have come from local congregations that were upwards around two, three, four hundred people in a local congregation. <laughs> years gone by, back in the day, as they say. So, Paul says here, look, endeavor to keep that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, forbearing, that is, be patient with each other, as verse 2 points out. Uh, he proceeds down explaining, and for the sake of time, I'll just go over it real quickly here and draw your attention to the fact that there is order in the church. There are certain functions and roles in the church, but there's a good reason for that. It's not for autocratic purposes. It's not for the ministry to rule and reign over the lives of the people. It has nothing to do with being a director of one individual's life. No, 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 no. The purpose of the ministry and all the functions that go with the many segments of ministry and teaching is this, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. I would hope that if a minister is indeed a, in the lectern, in the pulpit, and he is indeed teaching, that he is capable of teaching, that you are indeed getting some food, spiritual food, from what he's saying. Because if he's not, then he probably shouldn't be in there, and then you have to wonder why he is there, because if he is there and he's still teaching, uh, you know, what, what's going on here? And we've had that in the history of even the CGI, and we've had that in the history of Church of God at large where individuals probably shouldn't have been in the lectern and the pulpit talking about uh, things that they talked about. And, and certainly it's a growing experience for all of us as we vet through those things uh, in doing this pursuit of attempting to per, uh, perfect the work of the saints uh, in the church. But it says here that that is our job. It is our mission. We're not perfect at it, that's for sure, and that's what I'm saying. We're not perfect at it. We've made mistakes in the past. But, nevertheless, it doesn't dismiss this fact that it's for this reason, verse 13, chapter 4, book of Ephesians, till we all come in the unity of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the structure of the fullness of Christ. And that word perfect just means fullness. It means completeness. It means maturity. To the maturity of the faith, to where we're emotionally able that if indeed you need to tell me something about myself or if I need to be able to tell you something about yourself, that we can take it that we don't get offended, that we don't get upset, that we don't take our, as they say, our blocks and go home, that we have such a relationship or trust with one another and we are indeed endeavoring to keep the spirit of unity, that we can have hard talk if we need to have hard talk with each other. And as time goes forward, brethren, we may need to have harder talks with each other with regard to how things affect us and impact us in the lives we're living as we are finding ourselves surrounded by more and more immorality. It's much better, believe you me, it's much nicer to be together because there, are, there is strength in the bond of, of multiplicity. There is strength. And certainly uh, we can learn a lot from each other if we're patient with each other and we work toward attempting to try to understand each other for what each other has to offer. He goes on here and he says from, uh, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him and in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, com uh, compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure every part makes increase of the body into the edifying of uh, itself in love. He goes down here and begins to identify uh, certain things by saying, look, uh, this I say therefore and testify the Lord that you henceforth walk not no more like Gentiles in the vanity of your minds, having understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance uh, that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being in past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, It'd be a good idea just to Bible study these words. Understand what lasciviousness is. Get the Greek word, find it out, so you can identify what is Paul talking about. The work of all uncleanness, greediness. But if you have not so learned Christ, but you have not so learned Christ, if so, and I wrote, underlined this, be, I put it in quotes, if so, if you've learned Christ, be, be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Have new outlooks. Have a new perspective. Your own self-esteem. Look at yourself differently from the point of view of an upcoming, if you're young, a prince or a princess. If you're an older type and you got gray hair, perhaps as a future king, a future king in the kingdom of God. Those are the ways we should be living our lives as we are already in pursuit of this royalty of which God is promising each and every one of us. This renewal of mind, this new perspective of our purpose in life and what we're aspiring to because the jobs that we may have whether they be mundane or whether they be highly technical and very intense, the fact is they're just jobs. What's really important is what God is preparing you for in the kingdom of God. That's why I tell young people, get your college education. Make yourself everything you can make yourself. Be all that you can be. Be aggressive, be motivated, compel yourself into the challenges of life to learn the abilities that you're gifted and talented in because those abilities are going to be extrapolated out in the long term to renew this world in the kingdom of God via the laws of God. That's the long-term plan God has for whether we're young and unbaptized or old and unbaptized or whether or not we're old and baptized or whether we're young and baptized. The long-term plan is for you to become a king and a priest in the kingdom of God, helping Jesus, the Christ, our high priest, firstborn of God the Father, to rule and reign this planet. And it's time, now's the time, we should be living in this renewal that God has given us through his spirit. And you've got the empowerment, brethren, to begin living like this. So often, as we go down through this uh, particular dialogue here where we say, wherefore, putting away lying, he saw, and now he's going to get specific, put away lying. 
Speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for we're members of one another. Be you angry, but don't sin. Well, how do you do that? You need to study that. I don't have time to digress into it. How do you be angry, but don't sin? Let not the sun go down upon your anger. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that st stole steal no more, but rather let him work, working with his hands, the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needs. Here's a directive of, look, work aggressively, make money, make a lot of money, but you know what? Not to hoard, not to sit on, but to share. Work to give. Work to, to share charitably with others who do not have, always have that willing heart of service to those of lesser means if you've been blessed with greater means. If everyone had that heart, you know what? There wouldn't be any governmental forced programs. Fact of it is, I oftentimes think the government's overreaching anyway because deep down inside, people are built that way anyhow in many respects, but that's another story. He goes on here, he says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. What does he mean by that? Well, I'll, I'll give you a little insight on that. Corrupt communication could be a, a few things, including gossip or talking bad and evil about other people. He goes on here, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister favor, joy, or benefit is also the meaning of the Greek word grace. How often do we talk to people about other people to generate more favor in their minds? If I tell my wife about something, uh, about somebody, am I telling her that to, to accentuate the negative of that individual or to ingratiate the positive about that individual? Is that how we talk to other people about other people? Uh, what are we doing? What's the objective? What are, what are the results of our conversation? Are we indeed building the people up or are we tearing them down? That's what Paul is talking about here in this regard. We should, our conversation should be used to edify and to generate joy, favor, and benefit uh, for others. Grieve not, and that's what I'm talking about here in this regard. I told you I'd get to this scripture. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. What is grieving the Holy Spirit all about? It's very simple. As a matter of fact, it's quoted over here in the book of James. And I'll just turn there real quickly. In the book of James, verse 17 of chapter 4, to him that knows to do good and does it not, it is a sin. That's another definition of sin. It's the sin of omission. The sin of knowing what is right, but you exercise your will over God's will. You know you shouldn't lose your temper. You know you shouldn't say this. You know you shouldn't get angry. You know you shouldn't make the face that you're about to make. But you do it anyway. <laughs> you do it anyway. And then generally you get the reaction that you were expecting because usually the person who gets hit with that ball knows full well that they shouldn't respond in like manner, that they just should not react defensively, that they shouldn't rear up on their hind legs and growl, scratch, and put their claws out, but they do anyway. <laughs> they do anyway. And so we end up with a fight like a couple of cats on a hot tin roof. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. When we know not to do what we should, are about to do, and we do it anyway. Grieving the Holy Spirit is not allowing the Holy Spirit to be used in your life. You restrain the will of God in your life and allow your will to circumvent God's will. Do that too often, and guess what? You will forget God's will because one thing will lead to another, and before you know it, you won't be watering, tilling, fertilizing, and feeding the Holy Spirit in you through the four venues, through the four streams of, of growth that I mentioned before, prayer, Bible study, meditation, and fasting. You will forego some of that. You will fall off that, and that will only lead to more forgetting. So he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor 
and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. If you cannot forgive other people, why do you expect God to forgive you? That's the barometer. That's the relationship. That's the relativity that we all need to always keep in mind. That is really profound, brethren, when you use that, that barometer. The Apostle John, in one of his epistles, did he not say, how can you say you love God whom you don't see and you can't even love your neighbor who you do see? Tell me, how does that work? I had to tell a gentleman one time, how can you be asking to enter into a marriage covenant with God, because he was asking to be baptized, and I found out he was living with a woman, and I said to him, yeah, and you can't even make a commitment to a physical female that you're living with. He didn't like that. <laughs> he didn't like that. But it had to be said, because that was the elephant in the room. And the relationship of how he took that, which he didn't take very well, illustrated to me, quite frankly, he wasn't ready for baptism because his will was stronger than conceding to God's will. And he knew, he knew what was right, but he wasn't willing to give up his will to allow God's will to flourish and say, you know what? Okay, Bill, I hear you. You are exactly right. Let me work it out. I'll get back to you. That's what should have been done but sadly it was not. At any rate, I want to recommend reading, I'm going to give you some homework, Colossians 3, 1 through 17, because I don't have any time to go through this, Colossians 3, 1 through 17, and 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 16, 1 through 16. And I'm just going to advance here to Romans. I knew that was coming up. <laughs> I sensed it. <laughs> Romans 8. We're going to wrap this up. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 as we uh, conclude uh, this part 2 uh, of which uh, hopefully will help you to use God's Holy Spirit and to understand too, brethren, why the Holy Spirit is so important. And I think as you can see right now, the first reason, not necessarily the most important reason, but it's certainly a reason to have God's Holy Spirit is it affords you the empowerment to allow God's will to supersede your will in your life. And that's important, that you have that empowerment so that it can be made more easily possible in the expression of the standards and values that the Bible teaches us about Jesus Christ and the modeling that we should be partaking and participating in. So it stands to reason that we need the Holy Spirit. That was what really Christ was trying to say around the dinner table that night, that, look, you guys, it, it, it wouldn't be expedient for you for me to hang around. I've got to go back to the Father so that you can get this parakletos because you need it. You need it to empower you to help you overcome the poles of the flesh. So Paul over here in Romans 8 begins to bring it all together as he comes down through this narrative that begins up in chapter 7, verse about 15, and then kind of continues through 25 and actually continues through, uh, through chapter uh, 8 through about verse 15. And we're just going to pick it up on chapter uh, 8, verse 1 here. You would maybe perhaps want to read from 7, 15 through uh, when you get a chance. But in breaking into the context here in chapter 8, verse 1 of Romans, we read, there is therefore now those who, who are able to recognize that Christ is indeed the answer to their, to their challenges in life. He says here, there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. But here's the qualifier. There's no condemnation in those who are in Christ, who are baptized, who are in the community of the church. There's no condemnation, however, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's the qualifier. You must be focused on, prioritized on, walking after the spirit, not the carnal pulls of your nature. 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And that just goes to the point of the death penalty being removed. And there's a lot more deeper uh, dynamics on this too. But in short, it goes to the point of the death penalty being eliminated and you now are free from all of the liability associated with the sins prior to. But be that as it may, he continues on, verse 3 here, chapter 8, book of Romans, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, again, qualifier, it's not just a freebie, you're not entitled to it, it doesn't come without expectation, here it is, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Qualifier is, you've got to be prioritized. The spiritual values, the spiritual standards, the priorities of being spirit-minded now becomes uh, what you could say the priority of your life. He goes on here and he says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. To be carnally minded, verse 6, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And what this means, this carnally minded, it means to be carnally inclined. If that's, if that's how you're inclined, if that's your tendency, your, your, your um, uh, ways of doing things, you're always being distracted by those things, well then, guess what? You're, you're losing out. You're missing the boat because life is far more important than just the acquisition of the physical and the satiation of, of appetite, whatever those... Uh, desires may be of your particular appetite. He goes on, verse 7, because the carnal mind is opposed. It's, it's counterproductive. If you want to build a relationship with God, understand something and admit to this, that if you're going to be constantly prioritized on the acquisition of the physical and the material, you're going to hamper your growth and your relationship with God. It's just the way it works because God is spiritual. He's not concerned so much with the physical uh, as we may be being physical ourselves. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither can be. Verse 8 now. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But I'm in the flesh, Paul. Well, he's speaking metaphorically. He knows that. But he's talking about your attitude. He's talking about attitude. He's talking about your spirit persona, the way you approach life, your attitude toward it. He says here, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Metaphorically, you're in the spirit. So if so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. In other words, since you're going and you're, you're aspiring to become a spirit being, start acting like one now. Start acting like one now. Act like a spirit being even though you're in a physical body, even though you're in a physical body. He says here in uh, verse 9, halfway through, now if any man, here is the second point, very important, to have God's Holy Spirit. If any man have not the Spirit of God, he's none of his. Now what does he mean by that? Well, let's read on. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So there is life in you if you've got God's Holy Spirit. That's why I'm saying the Holy Spirit is indeed something. I hesitate to equate it with something physical, but I do know this. Once you have it, God recognizes it. God knows you've got it. God understands. There's something in about you that he sees we can't see we're physical but there's something that God knows you're sealed with that mark that spirit that ingredient of his that he knows you got his DNA you've got his DNA and so he says here and if Christ be in you the body's dead because of sin but the spirit of uh, is life because of righteousness but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you and this is why it's so important to have it brethren he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by or because of. That's what the Greek means. It means by or because of his spirit 
that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if we live after the flesh, you shall die. You Christians in Rome, if you continue to sin and live after the flesh, even though you're baptized, even though you've got God's Holy Spirit, even though you're impregnated with that Holy Spirit, even though God knows that you've got his DNA, you shall die. It's not once saved, always saved. No way. There are expectations on each and every one of us, and the clock is ticking on all of our lives, brethren, including mine. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if through the Spirit you do kill, that's what the word mortify means, kill the deeds of the body, you shall live. And that is, in essence, brethren, the message by which uh, God is indeed attempting to communicate to us uh, as to why it's so important to have his Spirit. Because secondly, if you don't have that Spirit, you've got no mechanism in you to afford the Father through Christ to trigger the change. It is necessary, and therein lies another very big reason for you to be motivated and compelled to get baptized. It's one thing to have that empowerment so that you might be able to have the ability to more enhancely fight your nature, but it's also secondly important to have it so that you've got the ingredient necessary to convert you to the ultimate stage. If you don't have it, you're going to miss that, regardless of how good you are, because the law cannot save. It never was intended to save. The law is anemic in that way. Only through the faith of Jesus Christ and your belief in his faith. Otherwise, if it was your faith, you'd be working for your salvation. It's not. You're riding on Christ's faith. And in that regard, your belief in that faith of Christ is very, very critical for you to then have that spirit in you so that God can trigger that ultimate conversion of your flesh to spirit, of your mortality to immortality. We are in the greatest fight, brethren, of our lives, the fight against our nature. I said that at the outset of the presentation. So therefore, it's so very, very important, and Christ tried to emphasize the importance of it that night addressing it two times, even after he interrupted himself from it, he went back to it to let his buddies know that night around the dinner table that the Holy Spirit was critical for them to have in getting through the life that they were living so that they might have the assurance of entering into the kingdom of God. Brethren, don't underestimate that. If you're baptized, hold the line. Grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Don't allow the Holy Spirit in you to be grieved. And those of you who are not baptized, the words of Peter ring loud and clear. Repent and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and receive the Holy Spirit.